thought I would do is give three examples of the intimate, interdependent relationship of human health to the health of the natural world from our new Oxford University book, Sustaining Life, How Human Health Depends on Biodiversity, for which Ed Wilson so generously wrote the foreword, to make the case that we have no choice but to protect the living world because our health and our lives depend on it. So this is our, our book, Sustaining Life, from which all these examples come. And the first one I want to talk about is polar bears. So these magnificent creatures, the largest land carnivores, evolved at roughly the same time that our species did, 190,000 to 200,000 years ago. It's predicted that they will be extinct in the wild by the end of this century, if not before, largely because of a, the melting of the Arctic uh, sea ice sheet, secondary to global warming. And this leads to an inability of polar bears to capture their main food seals, which emerge from thinning areas of the ice. The polar bears wait for them, grab them, and eat them. But with the ice melted all over, which is what is happening, the seals can come up here and evade capture by the polar bear. And that's why some of them, many of them, are starving. So polar bears have been given as the ex a sort of an iconic exam example of what will happen with climate change, but their medical value is rarely mentioned. So like all bears that hibernate, including this, these black bears, the mother and her uh, cub, polar bears are essentially immobile for several months at a time, five to seven and even longer months, and yet they don't get osteoporosis, thinning of the bone, which every other mammal, including ourselves, gets as a result of immobility. We lose, for example, a third of our bone mass if we're bedridden for five months. So all the time, our bones are in a dynamic process. We have cells called osteoblasts that are making new bone and cells called osteoclasts that are resorbing bone, and that process is going on all the time. But under conditions where there's no load on your bone, where the muscles are not pulling on the bone, that, that equilibrium shifts to resorption of bone, to osteoclast. And as I mentioned, every mammal, including us, loses bone mass during prolonged immobility, but hibernating bears do not. Osteoporosis is an enormous public health problem in the United States. It kills 70,000 people a year, mostly from hip fractures. It costs the U.S. economy $18 billion a year. Hibernating bears have substances in their blood that may help treat and may even prevent uh, this largely untreatable disease. Now, hibernating bears also don't eat, drink, urinate, or defecate for several months. They don't drink, and yet they don't become dehydrated. They don't eat, and yet they don't starve. They don't get rid of their urinary waste, and yet they don't become ill. They are the black belt recyclers of the animal world. They recycle everything. If we don't urinate for a few days, we die. There is no real treatment for end-stage renal disease other than kidney dialysis, renal dialysis, where you have a machine that removes urinary waste or a renal, a kidney transplant. Bears are somehow able to resorb their urinary waste in their bladder. They break it down into ammonia. It makes new amino acids and they lay down new protein. Nobody fully understands how they do this, but bears may hold the secret for treating end-stage renal disease, which kills 80,000 Americans every year, costs the U.S. economy $27 billion. Now, finally, polar bears become massively obese prior to, to, prior, prior to hibernation, and yet they don't develop type 2 diabetes, which we tend to do when we become massively obese. This disease in the United States is virtually epidemic now. It involves six, affects 16 million people, 5% of the population, kills a quarter of a million Americans every year. Again, denning polar bears, hibernating bears, the polar bears may contain the secret for understanding how to avoid type 2 diabetes with obesity, but they have to be studied in the wild. Next case is about Lyme disease. So this is an example of biodiversity in a human infectious disease. This is a map of Lyme disease cases, and each dot is a case. You notice the great concentration where we are, 
uh, middle Atlantic states and, and uh, around uh, Maryland and DC, but also southern New England, Cape Cod, uh, upper, middle, upper uh, Midwest, and California and Pacific Northwest. And this is the most common vector-borne disease in the United States. It causes 20,000 cases each year that are recorded. There's likely to be a very large number of cases that are not recorded because early Lyme is difficult to detect. It looks exactly, feels exactly like a bad flu. The ticks are very small, sometimes don't make a local skin reaction. Only 75 to 80 percent of the people get the classic bullseye rash. And Lyme, if left untreated, can cause very serious cardiac, neurologic, and uh, joint uh, health problems. It also can be fatal. So it was noticed that in areas of the country where there was, were low levels of vertebrate diversity, that there were, was an increased uh, incidence of Lyme disease. And my good friend uh, Rick Ostfeld did some elegant field studies to try to understand why this was. And here's what he came up with. So the tick is an omnivorous feeder. It bites anything that crosses its path. It bites mice, it bites squirrels, it bites us, it bites our dogs, it cats, even reptiles and birds. But most of the animals it bites are what are called incompetent hosts. In our case, we're a dead-end host. That is, we get Lyme, we get the infection, but if another tick bites us, it doesn't pass it on to another organism. Well, it turns out that this organism is an extremely competent host, the white-footed mouse. And it lives in, in the forest, and it actually does very well in degraded environments, so that it gets the infection, and the tick bites it and passes it on to another organism. So most of the animals that the tick bites are incompetent hosts like us. And therefore, if there is a lot of vertebrate diversity, there are a lot of incompetent hosts that the tick is biting, and the pathogen, the bacteria, that causes Lyme disease gets spread in this large population of incompetent hosts and doesn't keep the infection cycle going. So the more vertebrate diversity, which means the more intact forests you have, the less risk there is of our getting Lyme disease. This is called the dilution effect now, very big deal in infection, infectious and ecology. And this may also apply to other diseases as well. West Nile virus, a pneumonia cause, a very lethal pneumonia caused by a virus called hantavirus. And it also seems to apply to wildlife and even plants. But there's another mechanism. If you have a lot of vertebrate diversity in the forest, you also have competitors of this guy, and you have predators like uh, predator, competitors of, of the white-footed mouse for food, and you have predators like foxes and bobcats and eagles and weasels and snakes that eat these guys like Godiva droplets and keep their population down. And with the population down of the most common and best competent hosts, the incidence of Lyme disease and the risk of our getting it drops. So here's a really elegant example of biodiversity and a major human infectious disease. Finally, I want to talk about this organism. These are called gastric brooding frogs. Two species of gastric brooding frogs were discovered in the rainforest of Australia. The female swallows the fertilized eggs, which then hatch in her stomach. There they develop into tadpoles, and when they reach a certain stage of development, their mother vomits them out into the outside world where they complete their development into adulthood, become sexually mature, reproduce, and the cycle starts all over again. We thought as human beings, women had it tough giving birth. <laughs> so all vertebrates, including amphibians, including us, produce substances in our stomachs, uh, when food enters the stomach that begin the process of digestion, that release acid, release enzymes to start food being digested. So it was discovered, not surprisingly, that the eggs had uh, substances and the tadpoles released substances that prevented their being digested, that is, prevented the acid and enzymes from being released. So 
scientists were, of course, very interested in what these substances were because peptic ulcer disease, which is a disorder of the, of the stomach and, and intestine, but gastric peptic ulcer disease, affects some 25 million Americans during their lifetime in the United States. Again, a major public health problem. So they tried to analyze these substances and find out what they were and how they worked, but the research had to stop because these two species of gastric brooding frogs, the only gastric brooding frogs anywhere, found anywhere in the world, went extinct. Probably as a result of destruction of their stream and forest habitat, many of, or they were thought also to get a fatal fungal infection from a fungus called the chytrid fungus. There's some new literature that shows that climate change may have made them more vulnerable to get these chytrid fungus infections. But so these miraculous chemicals that may have evolved over millions of years that may only be found in gastric rooting frogs, that may work by a completely different mechanism from the one we, ones we know about inhibiting acid, inhibiting enzyme secretion in the stomach, those chemicals, their identity, how they work is gone forever. Think about that. So these three stories I've told to illustrate how our health depends on the health of other organisms and on the healthy functioning of natural ecosystems. Thank you.